Raw is a movie about cats, and it's kind of like teeth, in that watching it will probably put you off pussy for life. <laughs> but seriously though, this movie is insane. This video is brought to you by Audible, but more on that later. I was going to review the Lion King remake this month and go into great detail about why it's sh** until I realised that the Blu-ray isn't coming out in the UK until next month. Not this month, as it is in the US. There are many reasons I dislike living in this country, and stuff like this is just salt in the wound. But I do like cats. I have two of them at home, in fact. Hey. You wanna be YouTube famous? Well, I guess not then. And by sheer coincidence, around the same time I realised I'd have to delay the Lion King review until next month, on my subreddit, one of my fans suggested I take a look at Raw. I'd never heard of this movie, but it's been called the most dangerous movie ever made. So of course I was fully erect, and I was not disappointed. This film is absolutely crazy. Raw is one of those films where the story of its creation is far more interesting than the film itself. And that story is a wild ride. The film's premise is innocent enough. Writer-director Noel Marshall and his then-wife actress Tippi Hedren, who is perhaps most recognisable for her role in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, loved big cats. And I mean they really loved big cats. And they wanted to make a movie in which the cats were the stars and highlight the importance of the need to protect them from poachers and other human-related threats. The working title of the film was Lions, Lions, and more lions. You can already tell they weren't going to win any awards for writing. The couple began illegally housing lions they acquired from zoos and circuses, eventually amassing a menagerie of around 150 big cats, which they housed in their ranch in Acton, California, where much of Raw was shot. Now, these big cats weren't specially trained for being in movies, and were barely domesticated, if at all. And the couple were warned by professional lion tamers that bringing so many big cats together on a movie set was, to put it mildly, not a good idea. So what do you think happened when they took all of these big cats, put them in the same small area, and forced them to interact with each other and with a cast and crew, most of whom were woefully undertrained to deal with them? <laughs> You know those disclaimers that say that no animals were harmed during the making of this movie? Well, they need one of those for people because holy sh** that did not apply here. At least 70 members of the cast and crew, including the leading stars, were injured by the animals during filming. Some of those injuries being life-threatening. Marshall himself was injured numerous times, developing blood poisoning and gangrene. Hedron fractured her leg and broke her hand after being bucked off an elephant's back. Marshall's son John got bitten on the back of the head by one of the lions and needed 56 stitches. Hedron's daughter Melanie Griffith got clawed in the face and had to get 50 stitches and undergo facial reconstruction surgery. The cinematographer had his scalp bitten off by a lion and needed 220 stitches to sew it back on. Talk about suffering for your ass. F***ing hell. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of these injuries were captured on film and ended up in the movie. Where I come from, I'm an African, we don't, we don't come close to animals. We don't cuddle them, to kiss them, to go to bed with them, and we don't do that. I wonder why. As I was watching it, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Much of the film is taken up by these scenes, and I'm guessing most of them were unscripted. When you're really watching it, and you're seeing all these lions and tigers fighting, and you're seeing these people in the middle of all of this, none of it is staged. I mean, this really, really happened. Just knowing that a lot of this violence and blood were real, and knowing the genuine level of danger that these people were putting themselves in, makes Raw an unnerving and terrifying watch, but also a fascinating one. It really is something unique, and certainly something that couldn't be replicated today. You just couldn't get away with it. But Marshall refused to let the cameras stop rolling, even when the actors were crying out for help, because he didn't want to lose any takes. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, he was a massive arsehole during production. He even hit his son John for standing up to him. Although you do have to admit, the guy must have had balls of steel. Noel comes running out of the set, completely naked, with blood pouring down his body from these two puncture wounds from a bite, screaming 
at this lion which is running in front of him, just as a, this group of like 10 Japanese businessmen are walking up and here's their producer, director, star, completely naked, blood all over his body. He's crazy. He was crazy. It should come as absolutely no surprise to learn that staff turnover was high and very few people made it through the whole production from start to finish. In one incident alone, 20 crew members went <coughs> this and walked off set en masse. It was like someone called rap or cut or something in her lunch. Everybody wondered where the whole crew was going and the whole crew went, this is nuts. This is nuts. We can't do this. This is nuts. And like 16 professional camera people went that way. I'm honestly amazed that Marshall didn't get sued, and I can only imagine the waivers that these people must have had to sign. On top of this, the film was plagued by financial problems and other issues. Financiers withdrew their investments two years into production, so the Marshall family had to sell four of their houses and some of their irreplaceable movie memorabilia to pay off their debts. And they had to take over the jobs of various crew members to save money and replace walkouts. Then, three years into production, flooding destroyed most of the set, editing equipment and film, and caused over three million dollars worth of damages to the Acton Ranch, from which it took an entire year to recover. Fifteen lions and tigers escaped after fences and cages collapsed, leading to three of the lions being killed by local law enforcement, including the leading lion, Robbie. So much for no animals being harmed. When the sheriff said that he wanted to murder some pussy that night, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's probably not what he had in mind. And I very much doubt that allowing that tiger to get so close to that boat's motor fan was in any way in its best interests. All in all, filming took five years to wrap up, while the whole production from conception to completion took 11 years. It didn't help that, as anyone who's been to a zoo will tell you, big cats tend to be very lazy and boring. So the crew often ended up just filming the big cats all day in the hope that they would do something interesting, which they rarely did. And sometimes the crew resorted to some questionable methods to get the cats to follow the script. Just to even get the lions to drink the water, you, and you have to, they're not gonna drink on cue. So what would happen is we would uh, have to leave them up on this hot roof for like three hours before we'd film. You give them salted meat to so make them really thirsty. That's just not right, man. You gotta keep the pussy nice and moist. Okay, CJ, stop it. You've had your fun, now stop it. Bad dog. And what was the result of all this? The poster bills it as a ferocious comedy. Well, they were half right. I really get the impression that they secretly wanted to make a documentary, and that's probably what they should have done. There's some very impressive cinematography to be found here, and the original score is surprisingly good. And I think making this into a documentary would have better served the film's intended environmentalist purpose, instead of allowing it to be completely overshadowed by its production history and on-screen mayhem. But this isn't a documentary. It's a movie. And it's not a very good one. But before we get into that, I'm gonna need to take a walk. Walking noises. YouTube can be a very claustrophobic business, and I'm a depressive person at the best of times, so I've started making an effort to go for walks to clear my head. But I soon discovered one glaring flaw in this plan. It's really boring out here. And books aren't the most practical option. What? That's where Audible comes in. Audible has a ridiculous number of high-quality audiobooks that you can download to any number of devices to listen to on the go. Which, let's be honest, is just more convenient. Like, who has time for all of this? Audible membership gets you one audiobook plus two Audible originals per month, and those audiobooks you choose can be of any price. As a member, your credits roll over to the next month if you don't use them, you can cancel any time, and you get to keep your audiobooks if you do. I've been playing a lot of God of War recently, but I'm not too familiar with Norse mythology, so in order to know whose faces I'm smashing in, I've been listening to Neil Gaiman's Norse Mythology, expertly narrated by the author himself, which I've been very much enjoying. And if you sign up to Audible today using the link audible.com slash cynical reviews, or text cynical reviews to 500 500, you'll get to claim Norse Mythology for free, in addition to the other benefits of signing up. I mean, come on, it's THE Neil Gaiman, talking about Ragnarok. That's pretty cool. And you wanna be cool, right? So take a chance, educate yourselves, and help support my channel. Please? Alright, back to the pussy. 
The plot is thinner than the thread by which the actors' lives hung. Most of the scenes involve the animals messing around, attacking each other, or attacking the people. It seems like they had a very vague idea of what they wanted the plot to be, and then just built the film around what they could actually get the animals to do. For example, when they realised how much the animals loved chasing motorcycles, they put in a bunch of scenes to take advantage of that. The result is that, aside from the dangers the characters and of course the actors themselves were in, the film is pretty boring, but there are a fair few stupid moments that I'm more than happy to point out, especially when it comes to the ridiculous dialogue and bad acting across the board. You expect I to sleep with the lions, are you? What do you care if I sleep with my wife? Except for the fear. And that wasn't acting. Marshall himself plays the lead role. He originally wanted Jack Nicholson to play the part, but he and everyone else wisely noped the f*** out of that. He plays Hank, a wildlife preservationist living in Tanzania. I think he's also meant to be a doctor? That part wasn't very clear, and they don't do anything with it. He's keeping hundreds of cats and other animals on his ranch, apparently to study their behaviour. Why a doctor would be doing this, and how he could afford to feed all these animals and stop them from tearing apart the local wildlife, is not explained. But the idea that Marshall was trying to convey is that if you're kind towards the cats, they'll be kind to you in turn. The closer you'd get to them, the more they'd like you and the safer you'd be. Yeah, tell that to this guy. Hedron plays his wife Madeline. Her daughter Melanie Griffith and Marshall's sons Jerry and John play their children called... Melanie... Jerry... and John. There's a lot of creativity on display here. Anyway, they've come to visit him and are waiting at Wakanda's finest airport. Hank's friend Mativo arrives to take him to pick up his family, while also informing him that the committee are coming to review his grant. Hank persuades a reluctant Mativo to come ashore, and they end up f***ing around for a bit until Hank introduces Robbie, who's basically Mufasa. Their whole life is uh, based on dominance. That's why we have such a great harmony here, because Robbie is such a gentle and loving ruler. That sentence is going to age like milk. We're also introduced to Togar, a rival male who's an asshole. Wait, is that blood? The committee shows up with a guy called Prentice, who's also an asshole. That's about all we find out about him. Prentice threatens to start shooting the animals, which you'd think would be a bit drastic, except that immediately afterwards some lions start attacking each other, and when Hank rushes off to break it up, getting mauled in the process, some tigers sink the boats and start attacking the committee members, literally drowning in wet pussy. Oh god damn it! Jokes aside, this must have been absolutely terrifying. I can understand why the water was so brown. Hank barely manages to calm them down so the committee can run off with their tails between their legs. Oh, what the hell's wrong with you? All you got's a few scratches. You're lucky Togar didn't get you. Yeah, look on the bright side, you pussies. Okay, that one didn't count. But feel free to debate it in the comments. While all this is going on, the family can't wait at the airport any longer, so they have to catch a bus that wouldn't look out of place in Mad Max. You know that your father and I were having problems, and we thought it would be better to be apart for a while. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. The heart, maybe, but what about the sex plan? What? <laughs> what? Who talks to their parents about their sex life? And with our sons there, too! Someday I hope you'll understand the beauty of restraint and self-denial. Well, I hope it wasn't restraint and self-denial that drove Dad away. <laughs> Hank and Mativo mess around for a bit longer, tidying up the house, keeping the lions from attacking each other, and even having a bath? Before finally setting out for the airport, tigers in tow. While they're distracted by Hank's questionable singing, the boat hits a tree in the water and sinks. Don't swim, they'll get you! Oh, okay, I guess I'll just sink then. Meanwhile, the family arrive at the ranch with all the cats mysteriously out of sight. There's a little tribute to the birds thrown in, and then the family opens all the doors and windows, so before they know it, the house gets swarmed with animals. Oh god, look what the cat dragged in. Really? You really went there? And I thought my jokes were bad. This is the best example of how wildly inconsistent this movie is with its tone, very quickly shifting from one extreme to the other. Not only is this jarring for the audience, but sometimes it's downright inappropriate given the context, as in the example. For the next half an hour or so, they try to hide from the animals or move from room to room to avoid being eaten as the cats tear the place apart, in scenes that could easily be put into a horror movie. As when Togar smashes his way through several doors to get to them, like he's in a furry remake of The Shining. Why 
Why did they ever try to market this as a comedy? The problem is that the seriousness of this sequence is often ruined by bad acting and stupid dialogue. Are you all right? You could've suffocated! You could've died, dummy! Are you fucking serious? Eventually, Robbie comes in to save the day and gets Togar to go away. Meanwhile, the committee is having some sort of meeting where this guy, who's important, I guess, I don't know, tells Prentice that he's not allowed to shoot the cats, but he just goes, oh, f you, I'll do it anyway. And they don't do anything to stop him. Given the events of that day, you'd think they'd want to put some measures in place at least, but apparently not. Hank and Mativo borrow some bicycles from a village, but they're incompetent with those as well. Mativo has a hissy fit and refuses to go any further. Knowing that he can't take the tigers with him to the airport, Hank persuades him to distract them with his shirt so he can sneak off. But if he knew he couldn't take the tigers with him, why didn't he leave them back at the ranch? The family spends the night inside a room they barricaded themselves in, while the animals are just... lying around? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Hank arrives at the airport, where the guy tells him his family got the bus, but agrees to lend Hank his car, so he drives back to pick up Mativo and the Tigers. Mativo doesn't want to ride with the Tigers, but Hank won't make the Tigers walk because he's a racist. So Mativo's like, F*** you, your family's probably dead by now, and it's all your fault. And do you know what your friends are probably doing to our family right now? They are making dinner of them. They are eating them. Mativo, shut up! They are sitting around eating them, cracking their bones. Shut up. They are licking their bones clean. Shut up. And off they go, before he manages to f*** up the car as well. So off he runs, leaving Mativo with the tigers and only an umbrella to defend himself. After a lot of sneaking around, hiding, getting wet, a bit of pointless bike riding, and almost getting obliterated by an elephant, the family manages to escape to an outhouse. But after everything that's happened, they still don't think to lock the f***ing door? Prentice and his mate turn up and start shooting the cats, until they're both attacked and killed by Togar, who Hank then drives off by running at him like a f***ing maniac. The cats sneak into the outhouse and nap all around the sleeping family. This convinces them that the cats aren't actually out to get them, which is a bit of a quick turnaround, all things considered. So the film comes to a happy ending as Togar gets made to f*** off once and for all, the family is reunited, they all learn to get along with the animals, and have a gay old time, ignoring all the horrific events of the day and the fact that two guys were just savagely mauled to death. No, seriously though, are there going to be any consequences for this? Unlike the film though, the ending to this story is not a particularly happy one. Raw was a financial flop. Compared with its $17 million budget, which makes it the most expensive home movie ever made, it brought in either about $2 million or $10 million, depending on who you ask. The film also took its toll on the family, with Marshall and Hedron divorcing one year after its release. Marshall would never direct a film again, and John reported that he had nightmares for years afterwards. Nevertheless, you have to admire their ambition for wanting to see this through, and for putting themselves through all this trouble to do something that they thought would make a positive difference. The whole message about preserving these animals is an admirable one, although if you do want your message to be seen by people, maybe don't put it near the end of the credits. And I think in at least one sense, we can agree with the point that Marshall was trying to make. In love, as in life, if you take good care of the pussy, the pussy will take good care of you. Sorry, I had to just get in one more. I was getting a shot of your ass. <laughs> Always appreciated. Thanks for watching, folks. Big shout out once again to all of my lovely supporters on Patreon. If you like my stuff, consider becoming a patron yourself. Feel free to follow me on social media and join my public Discord server to stay up to date, and I'll see you in the next one.